right, so this morning, Joshua chapter 10. We finished Joshua chapter 9 last week, um, and we're going to be getting Joshua chapter 10. If you remember, when we uh, covered there, uh, Joshua chapter 9, there was a lot going on there. The Israelites allowed themselves to be scammed, to be scammed by those sneaky Gibeonites. You know, had they come to the Lord, more than likely, that wouldn't have happened. The Lord would have revealed to them that the, they were getting fooled uh, by the Gibeonites, and everything would have turned out differently. But again, you know, God had a plan for everything. Even, even in that mistake that the Israelites made, God still had a plan in that. We're going to see that. If you remember, again, last week I said Joshua chapter 9 and Joshua chapter 10 pretty much tell an entire story. And so we are continuing in that story now in Joshua 10. And I titled today's message, The Day the Sun Stopped. And yes, my friends, it really did happen. And I'll get more into that. I'll explain a little bit more as I cover those verses. But aside from that, there's, gonna, there's just a lot also in this chapter, just in the first 27 verses that I'm going to be covering today, that um, you know, teach us a lot, that will show us a lot. This section that we're going to be covering, verses 1 through 27, tells of the Israelites' victory over a southern coalition of Canaanite kings who attacked Gibeon after they had made a treaty with Israel. So basically, this part of the story is a test. It's a test on whether Israel would be able to actually commit to the oath they made to a people that essentially scammed them. Would they be people of their word? They made an oath to God to protect them, and now would they keep, the, keep that oath? But the lesson I hope that you get today is that just as God, the Father, listened to his child, Joshua, when he prayed, he also listens to his children when we pray. And as you'll see Joshua prayer, Joshua's prayer wasn't about changing God's mind in any way. No, it was about laying hold of God's willingness. So I hope this section shows you that when our will aligns with God's will, and when we delight ourselves in the Lord, He gives us the desires of our hearts because his desire becomes our desire. And his will becomes our will. Now, the greatest visual truth of this is when Jesus asked his father to let the cup pass from him in Luke chapter 22. There we're told in verse 22 that the third time he prayed to his father, he said, not my will, but yours be done. After he prayed that third time, did he keep asking God the Father to take the cup? No, he didn't. He simply yielded to the Father's will without praying further for the cup to be taken away. So again, I hope that what you get from this message today is that as Christ intercedes to the Father for us, we as believers, as born-again Christians, we must pray by the Holy Spirit for changes that promote God's will and purpose. As I said, that's going to be one of the, some of the main things or the main themes that we're going to be discussing today, but we're also going to be one, seeing one of the greatest miracles that occurred ever. 
one of God's greatest, amazing, wonderful miracles that it's just hard to explain that boggles the minds of scientists and have, you know, people have tried to explain away. But we're going to see just how amazing and wonderful God is and how he does hear and answers prayer in a powerful way. So before we get into the first part of our passage this morning, let's pray and come to the Lord Ask him to speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for all those that are here, all those that are watching, all those that are listening. I pray that you will use this message to encourage, to strengthen, or to, to change lives, Lord. Change hearts and minds. Pray that you will remove obstacles that are getting in the way. Lord, we know that you have a message here in this beautiful story that you have for us. Your word speaks wonders, it speaks truth, it speaks powerfully, Lord, and we want to hear it and we want to be changed by it, Lord. So touch us, each and every one of us, and we also just encourage us if we're going through a difficult time and also just may just change us as a church lord as we grow and as we become more united lord and and i pray that you will do we know you are going to do a great thing this morning so fill this room with your spirit and keep us safe Sit at your feet now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, verse 1. And there the word of God says, Now King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had captured Ai and completely destroyed it, destroyed it treating Ai and its king as he had Jericho and its king. And that the inhabitants, inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were living among them. So Adonai, Zedek, and his people were greatly alarmed because Gibeon was a large city like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were warriors. Therefore, King Adonai, Zedek of Jerusalem, sent word to King Hoham of Hebron, King Piram, of Jarmuth, King Japhia of Lachish, and King Debir of Eglon, saying, Come up and help me. We will attack Gibeon because they have made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. So the five Amorite kings, kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces, advanced with all their armies, and besieged Gibeon and fought against it. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua in the, camp, in the camp at Gilgal. Don't give up on your servants. Come quickly and save us. Help us, for all the Amorite kings living in the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua and all his troops, including all his best soldiers, came from Gilgal. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. For I, ha I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. So Joshua caught them by surprise after marching all night from Gilgal. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel defeated them in a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them out of the ascent at Beth Haran, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel, the Lord threw large hailstones on them from the sky along the descent of Beth Haran all the way to Azekah, and they died. More of them died from the hail than the Israelites killed with the sword. With the sword. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. 
sun stand still over Gibeon, and moon over the valley of Ahalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. Isn't it written in the book of Jashar? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed its setting almost a full day. There had been no day like it before since when the Lord listened to a man because the Lord fought for, for Israel. Then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp at Gilgal. For the fourth time in this book, we're told how the reputation of Israel's victories had spread, spread among the Canaanites. Going back all the way to back chapter 2, Rahab had heard about what the Israelites did to the kings of the two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og. Then in chapter 5, it says that the Canaanites had heard about how powerful the God of Israel was. Last week, we're told that the reason the Gibeonites came to make a covenant with Joshua was also because of what they heard about Israel's God. And fourthly, when they came to Israel, when their lie was discovered, again, they came to them and said, well, we know how powerful your God is. In all four of those instances, it's clear that everyone who had heard about Israel's victories, everybody who had heard about Israel's God were stricken with fear. Well, here in verse 1, once again, Israel's spreading fame is mentioned again. The king of Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek, heard about Joshua's doings at Ai and Jericho. And he had also heard about Israel's treaty with Gibeon. But for, his, for this king, it was, what the tree, it was that treaty, it was the treaty with the Gibeonites that Israel made with them that concerned him the most. It worried him the most, and he wanted to punish the Gibeonites severely for it. See, for them, if a great city like Gibeon capitulated to the Jews, then one more barrier was removed against the advancement of Israel in the land. So essentially, they saw Gibeon, their powerful army, as a buffer. It could be used to stop, possibly stop Israel from advancing forward. So it was important for the Canaanites to recover that key city, even if they had to take it by force. Verses 3 and 4 then tell us that Adonai Zedek sought the assistance of four other kings to resolve the Gibeonite problem and recapture the city. Now, I'm almost certain that as this confederation, as this alliance, as this coalition of armies and kings assembled, got together and were planning and, and trying to be on the same page, our God in heaven must have just been laughing. Our Lord does laugh, and we, you can see that in Psalm chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4. Now, why do I think that the Lord was laughing? Because unbeknownst to them, he was using these events, everything that was going on, to accomplish his purpose. You see, instead of having to defeat these five city-states one by one, He would help Joshua conquer them all at one time. Just as God used the defeat at Ai to form a battle plan, battle plan for victory over Ai, he was also using Joshua's mistake with the Gibeonites to protect Gibeon and speed up the conquest of Canaan. 
see church here what we see here is that the mistakes we make yeah they embarrass us it's embarrassing i was with my one of my my, my sons last week and made an embarrassing mistake and man i hate making mistakes i hate embarrassing mistakes things i should have known but yeah it happens we make mistakes that embarrass us especially those mistakes that are caused by our running ahead of the Lord and not seeking His will. But we need to remember that no mistake is final for the dedicated Christian. God can even use our blunders, our mistakes to accomplish His purposes. Think back about your mistakes, things you've done your mess-ups. God can use that. God can use those things for His will and purpose. Somebody defines success as the art of making your mistakes when nobody's looking. But a de better definition would be the art of seeing victory where other people see only defeat. God sees you, each and every one of you as his child. He wants the best for you and he listens to you and he sees you have already are victorious. He's made you victorious through Jesus Christ. Take hold of that victory, even when you've messed up and made mistakes. Own up to it. Apologize. Confess to the Lord. Get up and watch him use those blunders, those mistakes for his glory to achieve his purpose, to achieve his will. And so after creating a military alliance, <coughs> verse 5 says, these five Amorite kings and their armies went out to attack Gibeon. So what did Gibeon do? they immediately sent word to Joshua at Camp Gilgal to please come and help them. To please come and help them. What do you say there? They said, don't give up on your servants. Come quickly and save us. Help us. For all the Amorite kings living in the hill country have joined forces against us. There were a powerful army but they knew they were outmatched. Now, one of the reasons why Joshua was so drawn into battle with this alliance of Canaanites, this coalition, was because of his allegiance to the Gibeonites. See, he wasn't only committed he, he, was, he, wasn't only, uh, he isn't only to committed not to destroy them, the Gibeonites, thus honoring the dictates of the covenant made in God's name, but he was also committed to moving beyond covenantal commitment and defending the Gibeonites against anyone, against anyone who would try to destroy them was loyal. He kept his oath. He said, I made this promise and I'm going to keep it. Even if you did it under shady circumstances, even though you lied, I made an oath and I'm going to keep it. I am going to defend you against anyone who's going to try to destroy you. Now, here's the thing. In spite of their paganism, these Gibeonites are a good example for people to follow today. See, when they knew they were headed for destruction, they came to Joshua. Remember what I said, Josh, who Joshua was? Joshua's name means a Jehovah's Savior, but he's 
kind of an image, a, re a representation, a, a, like a picture of our true Savior, our true, sa our true uh, Lord, Jesus. They came to Joshua and attained from him a promise of protection. Get that? When lost sinners realize their plight and turn to Jesus Christ by faith, he doesn't hesitate. He saves when, as a believer, a, um, an unbeliever comes to Jesus with sincerity. And that's why you, I say when, when I share the gospel at the end of our messages, I talk about sincerity because he looks at the heart. And when he sees that sincerity, when he sees a person's realization that they are lost sinners, he comes and rescues them right away, immediately. He saves them. He saves them from the bondage of sin and death and releases them. He released you. That moment, you opened your heart to Jesus and surrendered your life to him. He came right away. When the Gibeonites, Gibeonites found themselves in danger, they believed in Joshua's promise and called out to him for help. This also is what God's people need to do. They find themselves facing the battles of life. I'm aware, I know that many of you going, are going through some very difficult times. Many of you are having a hard time in, with your health, maybe in your relationships with your spouses, maybe in your relationship with your kids. Maybe you're having a hard time at work. You're, things are just going. The world seems to be crashing down on you, and everyone seems to be against you. You find yourself at war, battling all the time, spiritual battles, left and right, battles of life. Well, you need to turn to Jesus. You need to come to him and ask him to help you. The Gibeonites, like the Gibeonites who churned their whole burden over to Joshua and trusted him to keep his word, we have to do the same thing. We have to do the same thing as believers, as Christians, is to hand it over to the Lord and accept His will and purpose. And, and we may not understand it at the time. We may not get it. But we have to remember that He's doing all that for a reason and purpose. Maybe He's trying to refine you. Maybe He's trying to see what you've learned throughout your time so far as a believer, as a child, whether you've actually have been reading his word and studying it and allow it and been allowing it to soak in. He's checking to see if there's any fruit. But one of the important things that we do when we understand the grace and mercy and power of God is how easy and to turn that, those burdens over to God. Now, I know that it's easier said than done. But those of us that have done it, that have been there, we know that it's possible. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of faith and knowing that he will, again, rescue you. He, he told you. He tells you in his word what he's going to do, what he's done. He's made many promises to you. It's just a matter of you taking hold of those promises. He will keep his word, just as Joshua did. Now, in verses 8 through 15, and there's a big chunk of our passage here, there are three combined factors it gave Joshua success in this battle. Believing a divine promise, 
using sound strategy, stra sound strategy and calling on the, on the Lord in prayer. In verse 8, we see the promise. Joshua's actions here illustrate two important verses. The first one in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, whosoever is not of faith is sin. And the other one in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Whenever we believe, believe the promises of God and obey, obey the commands of God, we act by faith and it can expect God's help. You believe the promises of God and obey the commands of God. We act by faith. You are acting by faith, my brothers and sisters. And you can expect him to help you. The Jews didn't have to be afraid because God had already promised them victory. He already told them what was going to happen. God's promises of victory had encouraged Joshua when he became leader of the nation there in chapter 1, when he anticipated attacking Jericho in chapter 6, and we, when he attacked Ai after a humiliating defeat in chapter 8. God's promises would be fulfilled because as 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56 says, there has not one failed, there has, there has not failed one word of all his good promises. Now in verse 9, we see the strategy. But faith apart from works is dead. And Joshua proved his faith by using a wise strategy. He ordered an all-night march and a surprise attack on the enemy army. Strategy had to be used before when attacking Ai. It was a long trek from Gilgal to Gibeon, and the roads were uphill. But Joshua assembled his troops. He assembled his best troops and made the journey as quick as he could. No doubt, men were weary, they were tired, exhausted, hungry possibly, thirsty when they arrived at Gibeon. But the Lord was with them. The Lord gave them what they needed he gave them victory. What kept the soldiers going? What was it that kept them going even as exhausted and tired as they may have been? They held on. They believed God's promises and knew that victory was assured. God assisted the weary Jewish soldiers by killing the, en the enemy army large hailstones. The timely occurrence of the storm was itself a miracle, but an even greater miracle was the fact that the stones hit only the enemy soldiers. You read that story? Huge hailstones. I mean, we've seen the hailstones here, or the hailstorms here. Imagine that there's you know, two armies in the same area and only those hailstones, those, that hail, only hit the enemy army, even when they were attacking and fighting with one another. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing again that it would only hit the enemy soldiers. See, God took his special ammunition out of his storehouse and used it to good advantage. When God's people are obeying God's will, everything in the universe works for them. Even as Judges chapter 5, verse 20 says, the stars 
in their courses. When we disobey God's will, everything works against us. Read, John, read Jonah chapter 1 for a vivid illustration of this truth. Obey or disobey. I don't know, you, I don't know about you, but I, I would. I would rather live my life and to strive to obey, to listen, to follow God's will and not be against it. Far too long. I walked against his will, and my life came crashing down, as maybe, maybe many of you as well. And the third factor is found in, chapter, in verses 10 through 15, the prayer. The prayer, again, three lines. Now, the miracle of the hailstone was Nothing compared to the miracle of extending the day so that Joshua could finish the battle and secure complete victory over the enemy. His men were weary and the task was great. And if night came in, the enemy would escape. Joshua needed a special act. He needed a miracle. He needed some, God to do something great, something powerful, something extraordinary. He needed a special act from God to enable him to claim the victory the Lord had promised. promised. So Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. They were told what that prayer was. In the, verse, in the rest of verse 12. Sun stands still over Gibeon and moon over the valley of Ajalon. And then God answered there in verse 13. This here, this is the last miracle recorded in Joshua and was certainly the greatest Joshua prayed for God's help, and the Lord answered in a remarkable way. Now, this event is questioned by those who deny the reality of miracles and that only look to science for truth. That will only look... Now I'm not, again, bagging on my scientist friends and those who, you know have a passion for science and love it, you know, and they will tell you that, you know, how they come to their conclusions. But this is one of those events that they just can't explain or they try to explain away or they just ignore it. It's better not to even look at it. Miracles. Miracles are those events, those things that happen, that science, medicine, the world, nothing can explain. Nothing at all. And again, many of you have experienced miracles, have seen miracles happen, have seen it with your very eyes, and nothing at all I've been able to explain it. You've heard doctors say, a miracle. You've had family members see the change in your life, in your heart, and say it's a miracle. You've seen God work in powerful and a remarkable way. Again, going back to those who deny the reality of miracles. Say, how could God stop the rotation of the earth and extend the length of a day? They ask, without creating chaos all over the planet. Well, they seem to forget the fact that days are normally of different lengths in various parts of the world without the planet 
experiencing chaos. For example, this morning I can pick up my iPhone and read the evening's paper from a country that's on the other side of the world. You know, a funny way of looking at it is, you know, I could look to the future by reading tomorrow's paper. But that would be, if that really happened, it would be chaotic. It would be chaos. But how do you explain a miracle? Any miracle. Of course, the simplest answer is the answer of faith. Jeremiah chapter 32. The Lord is God and nothing is too hard for him. Friends, day and night belong to God. And everything he has made is his servant. Everything that he created serves him. If he created the universe, he can snap it out of existence if he wanted to. If he created, if he created your favorite pet, your favorite, you know, whether it's a cat or dog or, you know, I don't know, a chinchilla, whatever it may be, he can, he can snap that out of existence if you wanted to. He is the creator of everything. He can do whatever he wants with what he created. He created day and night. So day and night is his servant. Now, if God can't perform the miracle described there in Joshua chapter 10, then he can't perform any miracle and is imprisoned in his own creation, unable to use or suspend the very laws he built into it. I have a very difficult time in believing in this and that kind of God. The God I serve, the God I believe in, exists outside of our time, in our, of our world, outside of just our, ex, our human existence. He's greater than what we can perceive, what our senses can hear, taste, smell. He's outside of time. Yes, he created that unmovable rock, unmovable object. He did all that. He created all the laws of nature. Created the sun, created the moon. An Old Testament expert, Gleason L. Archer, points out at the phrase, uh, there in verse 13 indicates a slowing down of the movement and not a complete cessation. In other words, the sun and moon didn't stand still permanently and, didn't, and then suddenly go down, but were held back so that the daylight was lengthened. God stopped the sun and moon and then slowed the earth's rotation so that the sun and moon set very slowly. Such a process would not create chaos all over the world, all over the globe. Now, somewhat similar to this view is, the sun, is that the sun and moon remained on their normal course and it only appeared that the day was lengthened because of the way God caused their light to be refracted. But here's the thing, verse 13, there states once that the sun stood still and twice that the sun and moon stopped. However, these verbs, those verbs there, it doesn't mean or describe a permanent situation, but possibly the beginning of the miracle. 
God stopped the sun and moon in their courses and then controlled the gradual descent, all while causing the light to be refracted for a much longer period of time. Now, again, I'm giving you just, you know, I'm not giving you the details. And as I said, I'm not a scientist, but any scientist will be able to explain that further to you. Since verses 13 through 15 are poetical in form, a quotation from an unknown book of Jasher, Jasher is mentioned there. Now, I don't have the time right now. I think this is one of those, one of those areas that will, may require a totally separate teaching on what that may or may not have been, the, the book of Jasher. Details aren't given. It's an unknown book. But there, some have interpreted the word symbolically, those words that are mentioned there. In this last half of verse 13, saying those, and symbolic, but by saying that God helped Israel so much that the army was able to accomplish two days' work in one day. But Joshua's prayer do sound like, Joshua's words do sound like a prayer. If you read them carefully again, he says, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon over the valley of Ajalon. To me, it does. It sounds like a prayer. It do sound like a prayer that the Lord would intervene in. And the description of what occurred doesn't read like the report of an, of an efficiency expert. But even in hearing these explanations, some explanations that, again, seem to make sense, here's really the question. Why even try to explain away a miracle? What does that prove? What are you trying to prove by trying to explain a miracle? Certainly not that you're smarter than God. Either you believe in a God who can do anything, or you must accept a Christian faith that is, that's non-miraculous. And, that and that does away with the inspiration of the Bible, the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and everything in between. All those miracles, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, healing the blind, healing the lame, the mute. Delivering people that were possessed. God, if, if we accept that our faith is non-miraculous, then you can do away with all that. But our faith is a faith where miracles do occur and have occurred. Jesus shows us, told us, and, in, and just his resurrection alone, that, my friends, is a miracle. One of the great, the greatest miracle, I think, in the entire Bible. Person, Jesus, dying, and three days later, rising from the grave. Now, certainly, there's room for honest questions about the nature of the miraculous. But for the humble Christian believer, there's never room for questioning the reality of the miraculous. If you're a believer, don't try to explain away a miracle. I, I don't. I mean, I, I can't. I, you know, I've seen those, you know, those, some of those crusades, and they televise it, and, you know, people have actually been, you know, where it's not a scam, and, you know, people have actually been, I've heard the stories where people have actually been healed. 
I'm not going to explain it away. I'm not going to say it was fake. You know? God does amazing things, and He can. He can heal. He can use, you know, use people to do great things as His instrument. So I'm not going to question the reality of the miraculous. And neither should you. C.S. Lewis wrote, The mind which asks for a non-miraculous Christianity is a mind in process of relapsing the Christianity into mere religion. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me also share with you an important fact, another important fact in this entire story. God the Father listened to his child, Joshua, pray. And he listens when we pray. As a believer, you should be confident in the power of our omnipotent God who bends his ear and listens to his children praying. You may lay hands on one another in order to help one another, but God lays ears on us because he wants to hear the cries of your heart. He wants to hear you. He wants to hear those words from you. He wants to hear you say, Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. Lord, rescue me. Again, it can be so easy to take those things, those words for granted. Let me ask you, those of you who are fathers, those of you who are mothers, parents, uncles, aunts, whatever it may be, when you hear the cries of that person, that child that you love, do you just ignore them? No, you listen. You listen intently. You want to hear that and you want to you want to help them as much as you possibly can. But you want to hear it. Now, if that child is, well, I, I guess you do whatever you want to do. I mean, it's, what, what does that tell you? You want, again, you want that sincerity. You, basically, he's telling you by him saying that he just doesn't care. You're more than likely going to want to help them out when they're crying out to you. You're more than likely want to hear what they're saying. Their cries, especially if they come from the heart. Well, likewise, God wants to hear the cries of your heart. All right. I think we're doing good in time. Let's, I'll, again, I'll touch some more on this, some of this stuff at the end of our message here. But let's read the end, the last part of our, the second half of our passage this morning. So, Joshua chapter 10, verse 16. Now the five defeated kings had fled and hidden in a cave at Makeda. And it was reported to Joshua, the five kings have been found, and they're hiding in the cave of Makeda. Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and station men by it to guard the kings. But as for the rest of you, don't stay there. Pursue your enemies and attack them from behind. Don't let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has handed them over to you. So Joshua and the Israelites finished inflicting a terrible slaughter on them until they were destroyed. Although a few survivors ran away to the fortified cities, the people returned safely to Joshua at the camp of Makeda. And no one dared to threaten the Israelites. Then Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me, out, out to me out of there. That is what they did. They brought the five kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmouth, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Egalon to Joshua out of the cave. 
When they had brought the kings to him, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the military commanders who had accompanied him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So the commanders came forward and put their feet on their necks. So Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord, for the Lord will do this to all the enemies you fight. After this, Joshua struck them down and executed them. He hung their bodies on five trees, and they were there until evening. At sunset, Joshua commanded that they be taken down from the trees and thrown into the cave where they had hidden. Then large stones were placed against the mouth of the cave, and the stones are still there today. When Joshua was informed that the five kings of that coalition, that confederacy, were hiding in a cave. He gave orders for the cave to be temporarily sealed by large stones until the enemy, the enemy's retreating armies were captured. Joshua said to his officers, who had heard God say to him, don't be afraid or discouraged. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. Joshua said to his officers what he had heard God say to him. There in verse uh, 25, don't be afraid or discouraged. Be strong and courageous. Friends, church, this is what God's intention, this is God's intention in our communication. We are to say what we have heard God say. You are to say what you heard God say. Here's a term I'm going to throw out to you, but I'll explain what it means. This is what hermeneutics is all about. Hermeneutics is a science of interpreting the biblical text. We are to say what God says, exegesis, and not twist the text so it says what we want it to say, which is exegesis. We must interpret, we must read and say what the Word of God says. Not to be twisting it. So Joshua proceeds to tell his officers, your foot being on the necks of these enemy kings is what the Lord intends for you to do with all the enemies that you're going to fight. See, God intended for them to go from victory to victory. This is also a picture of what God intends for us today as believers. Figuratively speaking, God desires us to put our feet on the necks of Satan and his, and his agents and his minions we are to be in a position of victory and not defeat, of strength and not weakness, of valor and not fear. What position are you in during your battles? Are you on your back, exposing yourself and saying, oh, woe is me? Or are you fighting? Are you in a position of victory, knowing already that you have victory over Satan through Jesus Christ? God gives you, puts you in a position of strength, gives you the strength. You're not a child of weakness. You're a child of strength, my friends. You are in a position of valor and not fear. This is the hardest part. That when you are going through something horrible, something terrible, something that, again, just is it. 
affected you, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally? Are you in a position of valor or are you in a position of fear? Are you fearful of the outcome? Are you fearful of what's to come, what's ahead? Are you standing there like, I'm here and nothing's going to, I'm not going to let Satan get the best of me. I'm a, vic I'm, I'm, I'm a person of valor. do anything. I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. Don't lay on your back. Don't be that person that just gives up. You know, one thing I learned in, you know, early on when I first got to the academy, say, hey, you know, most of the, most of the law enforcement officials, officers who have died out in the line, a lot of them, they died because they gave up. They cowered in fear and just gave up. But those who had the will to survive, those who had that strength, those who knew they had a purpose to live, they did. For the most part, they lived. So I, you know, told myself after hearing that, you know what, I'm not going to be that person that if I get shot or if I get, you know, something happens to me, I'm not going to cower and just wait to die. No, I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to fight as long as I possibly can, as long as the Lord's, you know, given me that, the strength. And I, again, I know that he has a will and purpose for me, and I'm not just going to cower and die and or roll up into a little ball and just die. No, I'm going to keep going. I have a daughter. I want to see her get married. I want to see her have, have two boys. That it, I want to see them have children. I want to go on more vacations with my wife. You know, I want to be able to see her as she gets old and wrinkly and, you know, I have to push her in the wheelchair, you know. I... I have so much to, to look forward to. And as, as I said, I, I don't know what the future holds and what lies ahead. And God does. But I know, again, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm not going to just give up. I'm not going to just give up and just die. No, we keep going. And so should you. My point in saying is, uh, don't give up. Keep fighting. Keep going. As long as you have breath in your lungs, He has a purpose for you. Even when it hurts, even when you're it's just, uh, you want, every breath you take hurts. He has a purpose for you. As long as you have a heartbeat, He has a purpose for you and when that breath ends and when that heartbeat is no more that's when he'll receive you up in his up in heaven and say welcome my good and faithful servant endure fight you're a person of valor you're a person of strength you're a person of as victory. The Israelite victors resting the feet on the necks of their defeated foes foreshadows what God has promised to do to all evil as early as Genesis chapter 3. Friends, righteousness will trounce evil and God's will, it will prevail. Ultimately, Joshua and the Israelites soundly defeat and destroy the retreating soldiers and their cities. The victors executed the five kings who had hidden in the cave, who were hidden in the cave, and buried them in that same cave that had been their hiding place. 
God gave the southern cities to Israel's hands. And once again, Joshua is a mighty conqueror, respected in the eyes of all Israel. That's, that part is going to be next week, but just giving you a, giving you a taste of what's, you know, what we're going to be reading next. If Joshua, not having the benefits of the historical incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, the greater Joshua, if he could pray and seek God's work in a miracle for him to accomplish his purpose, certainly we can cast our cares on him. Let me ask you, what problems can you have that God can't handle? What problems are you going through that you think God wouldn't be able to handle? God can handle anything and everything. If He can make the sun stop, He can handle your problem. He can handle your issue. Is there anything, my friends, is there anything too hard for God? As Christ, our great high priest, intercedes for us, believers, us believers, we must pray in the power of the Holy Spirit for changes that promote the purposes of God, the purpose of God. St. Saint Augustine famously put it this way, Pray as though everything depends on God and work as though everything depends on you. Let me repeat that quote. Pray as though everything depends on God and work as though everything depends on you. Keep going. Don't give up. But while you're going, pray. Don't stop praying. Give it to God. A thing that I forgot to mention was as big as a miracle as this day was, when the day the sun stopped was, the bigger miracle is Him rescuing you. Him rescuing each and every one of you from going to hell from death, destruction, annihilation, pain, suffering. Not annihilation. I don't want to use that word, but he rescued you. Think about how far down in the bottom of the barrel you were, how bad it was for you. Everyone had given up on you. Everyone didn't think there was any chance with you. But not Jesus. Not God. When you heard those words that God sent His only Son, His only begotten Son, to die for you, that meant He saw in you something special. He sees in you something great, something special. And even though the whole world may have given up on you or has given up on you, God does not. He hasn't given up on you, my friends. Let me... Before I share some final words about that, let me just close up with this summary of what we just read. That coalition of five kings against Joshua was actually, it was actually a personal attack against God and a threat against the fulfillment of the promise of God to Abraham. If this coalition, coalition had defeated Joshua and Israel, it would have wiped the tribe, it would have wiped out the tribe of Judah Therefore, the corridor or channel through which Jesus 
was born would have been extinguished forever. See, God had to ensure Joshua's victory by routing the enemies before Israel, killing all of them, chasing them, striking them, and casting down large hailstones until they all died. Well, guess what? One day, Jesus, the greater Joshua, would be born at Bethlehem of Judea and later on Calvary would win the greatest battle against Satan and the coalition of hell through his death and resurrection. The author of uh, the book of Joshua says in verse 14, there has been no day like it before or since. But here's the thing, we must look 1,400 years later to see the sun stand still again. Read it for yourself, Luke chapter 23, verses 44 and 45. Yielding its will to the moon-veiled day, paving the way for the sun of righteousness to rise three days later with healing in his wings. We have a greater Joshua now that you could come to. He, as I said earlier, will rescue you. If you need that rescuing, if you need, if you're at that place where you, you're essentially the Gibeonites and the, these, you know, five Amorite kings are fighting against you, you can come to the greater Joshua today right now and ask Jesus to rescue you, and he will, and he will do it immediately. Okay, let me be clear. I'm speaking spiritually here. Spiritually, if you're an unbeliever, if you're unregenerate, if you're not born again, you're spiritually dead, and you will remain dead until you are born again. If you want Jesus to come and rescue you, if you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, if you want to walk in obedience, I invite you to the cross to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want to remind as Lord and Savior. And I want to remind you again. By doing that, by sincerely doing that, it's going to be a greater day than when the sun stopped. You can prove all the haters wrong. You can prove all those that didn't believe, don't believe in you wrong by showing them that you're now a child of God. So if you're ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you need some help praying and you, you don't know how to pray, you've never prayed before, well, let me help you with that. So I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and, as, and, and, and just think as if you're right below the cross of Jesus and, and you're looking at him and you're seeing the punishment that he had to endure for you, for your sins. I want you to pray this with all your heart, with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you to please forgive me. I now, this very moment, believe that you died for my sins. Three days later rose from the dead. I sincerely repent for my sins, turn away from them, and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. I renounce all idols. I renounce everything that isn't you. 
that I've made into a God and I throw them all in the trash. I seek only you. Thank you for dying for me there on the cross. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. And thank you for saving me from sin and death. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, reach out to us. We want to help you. We help you find a church, whatever it is. Again, we're praying for you. Let us know how you went about hearing this message, which you, how it blessed you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all next week as we finish in Joshua chapter 10. Have a great day. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.